Hello, I'm Juliet Mann, and this is the Agenda Podcast, CGTN Europe's one-stop shop for smart, in-depth discussion of the issues that really matter in the world today. Ten years after President Xi Jinping first announced his plans for a Silk Road economic belt, this week, world leaders gathered in Beijing for the third Belt and Road Forum. Since 2013, more than 150 countries and over 30 international organizations have signed cooperation documents. But what's been the true global impact of the initiative? Joining me now is the former president of the European Central Bank and ex-governor of the Bank of France, Jean-Claude Trichet. The BRI is marking 10 years now of investing big in roads and railways and, and power plants um, all along the old Silk Road and beyond. How important are schemes like China's Belt and Road Initiative when it comes to stoking global growth? It was obviously a very important initiative. There is no doubt uh, about that. The, world, the entire world reflected on it. A lot of countries have part are participating in it. The World Bank made uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, appropriate uh, uh, exams and uh, studies on it. Uh, so, again, uh, it is part of the uh, initiative that are taken the world over to accompany the uh, enormous amount of global trade that we have now to cope with. And uh, taking into account the fact that together with the European Union, China is a major participating power in the global trade, both uh, importers and exporters, as well as us in Europe. Uh, we, we consider, of course, to facilitate all roads, all links that exist between us, I would say, China on the one hand with the BRI, the European uh, on the other hand with the global gateway now, uh, and the rest of the world is certainly a good thing, obviously. I want to ask you about the Global Gateway in, in just a moment, but, but let's first talk about what you've called slow globalization and, and rising global debt as being quite worrying trends. I mean, China has spent tens of billions of dollars on Belt and Road bailouts and emergency funding. BRI, it, it's, it's as much about relationship building as infrastructure, isn't it? Yes, indeed, because, because the idea is, uh, of course, uh, to have uh, global links uh, that uh, would be on a continuous basis and permit, uh, I would say both, I would say, the roads and the countries to participate in, uh, in the, the, the trade, the, fl the flux of trade. So that's, that's true. I mentioned myself as a, a worrying factor at a global level, amongst others, by the way, uh, certainly the idea that uh, over-indebtedness was uh, a, a big problem. Uh, we continued to uh, over-indebted, uh, all of us, if I may, uh, the uh, emerging countries, the advanced economies, and the poorest countries of the world since uh, all the successive last crises, uh, after the Lehman crisis, after the COVID crisis, we continued to uh, augment the global debt outstanding. It's not a good thing, obviously. Uh, and, of course, uh, when we are in these uh, circumstances, we have to accept from time to time that uh, we have to take stock of the fact that some countries are not able to repay what they have borrowed. And this is certainly a problem that uh, we all share today. Yeah. Uh, and that China is sharing also with the other creditor countries of the world. So I hope very much that we will do all what we can to surmount those difficulties and not to continue uh, to, uh, I would say, observe uh, global, state, uh, global debt outstanding growing faster than global GDP, which is yeah. unhealthy, obviously. Well, talking about those difficulties, I wonder what long-term um, impact um, geopolitical events um, are having, in your view, things like the COVID-19 pandemic and um, things like the, the war in Ukraine. And it's also a sign that everywhere else in the world, anything is possible in the present uh, situation. So uh, clearly, it's a formidable embarrassment for uh, I would say the 
international community as a whole, certainly for uh, global trade. And it's part of this, uh, I would say, hedging against global trade, hedging against uh, the very long international global value chains, which is part of the uh, difficulty that uh, we have to cope with. And it's the reason why I am very much speaking from time to time of slow, much slower globalization, if I may. After Lehman, and until the COVID, we had a period of extremely rapid globalization, extremely rapid, uh, I would say, taking advantage at the global level of division of labor. And uh, that contributed enormously to global growth and, uh, and to uh, global prosperity. We are, because in particular of these uh, geostrategic tensions, in a different world, and we have to protect as much as possible, in my opinion, global cooperation, accept that uh, in a way, and COVID demonstrated that too, we have certainly to try to de-risk, if I may, the most risky, uh, I would say, international value chain, but certainly not decouple. And I think that I express the views of the European yeah. in saying that it is not at all our intention to decouple. So let's talk a little bit about that global cooperation. We, 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 we've spoken about Belt and Road, and you brought up the, the global gateway. Well, where do schemes like that fit in? You know, can Europe's global gateway compete with um, the Belt and Road Initiative, or do you see it as serving an, an altogether different purpose? Well, I mean, in a way, of course, it's not abnormal that the two major, uh, I would say, trade powers of the world, China on the one hand and the European Union on the other hand. Of course, you have also the United States of America as the third a very important uh, power, particularly in terms of imports of trades and, and uh, services, of uh, goods and services, uh, not, not as an exporter of goods and services, uh, but China and the European Union are major partners in participating at the highest level in global trade. So it's not abnormal that they have a look at their own trade links and the, the, their own trade, I would say, uh, uh, ancient and present uh, uh, routes. Uh, so, again, I don't see the global gateway as a competitor, but as a way to be sure, as well as China is, uh, has a way to be sure that the trade roads are there and secure and functioning normally. The Europeans have also a stake in having trade roads yeah. that would function as well as possible. Uh, it's not uh, concentrated only on trade between China and, uh, and Europe, of course. Uh, it's uh, something which is much more global. I see a lot of advantages uh, in looking at these two major initiatives. Uh, China started the initiative uh, ten, more than 10 years ago, of course. Mm. Uh, the Europeans are more recent in embarking on this initiative. I take it that these two initiatives are designed to contribute to gro global prosperity and uh, global activity. Well, you mentioned that 10-year anniversary of, of, of the Belt and Road Initiative. And against that background, there, there are lots of conversations happening at different diplomatic levels between the United States and China, China and the European Union, and so on. So where do you think those conversations are heading? As I told you, uh, I think that uh, we have to preserve uh, global prosperity, global cooperation, from the risks that are associated with elevated tensions in the geostrategic area uh, with the possibility of deterioration in this domain. We do not think, and I do not think, that there is any, uh, I would say, uh, appropriate uh, route in the direction of the decoupling between China, Europe, 
of the U.S., I think that that would be very, very bad, obviously. And bad both, I would say. Uh, when you uh, are looking at the interest of all parties concerned, certainly European, certainly China, and very bad for the prosperity of the entire world. We are all deeply coupled with the entire world. And I have to say that uh, China and uh, the European Union are extraordinarily linked to the rest of the world, not only between them, but to the entire rest of the world. And of course, any kind of uh, big deterioration of the relationship uh, in terms of uh, global trade would uh, hamper very, very much, of course, those economies and countries that are the most open to international trade and uh, goods and services and will hamper considerably the rest of the world. So again, I accept, of course, the necessity in some certain domain, as has been demonstrated, by the way, in the COVID case, that we have to de-risk, perhaps, certain, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, certain links, certain international uh, global value chain, but certainly not to decouple. Decou decoupling would be against the interest of all, against the prosperity of the entire world, including the poorest, country, the most, uh, I would say, um, countries in difficulty, the most uh, country uh, in Africa in particular, but also in Asia and Latin America, that, have a, that are badly in need of global prosperity to continue to grow and, uh, and have uh, uh, appropriate prosperity for their fellow citizens. Jean-Claude Trichet, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. According to China's recent white paper on the Belt and Road Initiative, released ahead of this week's forum, the BRI is committed to open, green and clean cooperation towards inclusive and sustainable development. But what does that look like in practice? And how might it develop as the world edges closer to net zero goals? With me now is the president of the Green Belt and Road Development Initiative and former Under Secretary General at the United Nations, Eric Solheim. Great to see you on the agenda again. Now, after 10 years of Belt and Road, what, what do you think the, the value of the BRI is to you? The value is, of course, enormous. This is the biggest uh, investment scheme in our uh, time with an enormous potential to bring people out of poverty. And it has actually brought many people out of poverty. It's true in the beginning it was too much focused on coal and on oil and gas. But now we see a massive reorientation into green energies. And of course, Belt and Road obviously is also a fantastic opportunity to connect China, the, maybe the most important culture nation in world history, uh, with the rest of the world. Now, BRI evolved from this general framework into concrete projects. Now, we know about the big ones, like the Port of Piraeus um, in Greece, um, the high-speed rail in, in Laos, um, and, of course, some gas pipelines all across Asia. Tell us though, about some of the, the smaller projects that are making an impact on communities and economies. Let me bring you to a nation very close to my heart, which is Sri Lanka. Uh, I was the chief negotiator in the peace process there for many years. And at the time, uh, moving around in Sri Lanka was a bit complicated. It took a lot of time because the roads were narrow and there would always be an enormous traffic on uh, every road. It took also a lot of time from the Bandaranaike airport into the city center of Colombo. When I came back last year, it was a com <laughs> complete difference. It took half an hour at very beautiful uh, um, uh, motor roads. Uh, from, the, from the city centre to the airport, uh, the connections between Colombo, the capital, and the beaches in the south, which is so important for an economy based on tourism, uh, and are beautiful. Uh, uh, you can go at, at high speed without uh, uh, the, a big uh, danger of, of road accident. So it's a sea change, benefiting the people of Sri Lanka in a direct sense, because they can get better communications, but of course also benefiting the economy because tourism is the number one income generation um, business in, in Sri Lanka, and it will be much easier with this better communication, all built by Sri Lankan hands, but by Chinese capital and, uh, and our side. 
So Sri Lanka then is a great example. I mean, to, to what extent do you think that the BRI has addressed some of the, the major bottlenecks that are restricting connectivity and, and economic growth in the developing world? Uh, let's look to, to the Southeast Asia as a starting point, or Africa. Of course, in Africa, Belt and Road has connected two of the biggest cities, capitals of Africa, Addis Ababa and Ethiopia, and Nairobi uh, in Kenya, with port cities, and making, of course, the economy going much easier and tourism also uh, improving. It would be an enormous benefit if the next step in the Kenya Rail could be Mombasa to Nairobi to Kisumu, which is already there, taking it to Uganda, to Rwanda, Burundi, uh, and linking these landlocked countries at the center of Africa, but very far from the coast, to the coast, uh, which make their economies uh, much stronger. And the same in Southeast Asia, Laos, uh, China Railroad is uh, finalized. And last week, uh, Bandung Jakarta Railroad in Indonesia was open. If that can be taken from Bandung to the second biggest city in Indonesia, Surabaya, well, I think today it takes about 10 hours to go from Jakarta to Surabaya. Uh, with high-speed Chinese-style rail, it will take about three hours. And there are 150 million people living in Java, and they will be connected in a completely new way, benefiting the people and benefiting the economy. And there are now also huge plans for Trans-Malaysia, Trans-Thailand railroad, so you can, in, in a five to ten years horizon, see a completely interconnected uh, Southeast Asia with China, and through China, by the way, with the global Europe-China network. Uh, which will be, have massive potential benefits for tourism, for connecting people, but at the core, of course, for the economy of these nations. You, you talked about rail, you, you talked about roads, but for, from solar to wind to, to hydropower, how has uh, the Belt and Road moved in a green direction, and, and why is it important? There was a very interesting development, because two years ago, President Xi Jinping decided that China will stop all overseas coal investment. But that happened at a time where there was a similar uh, evolution happening in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, and in Kenya. They decided maybe we shouldn't ask China for coal plants, and China decided we will not build overseas coal plants. And then, of course, you see a massive reorientation into solar, wind, hydropower, all the green technologies. And look, Chinese companies are now by far the biggest in all these areas. Longi is the biggest solar company in the world. Goldwyn is the biggest wind company in the world. BYD, the biggest electric vehicle company in the world. CTL, the biggest electric battery company in the world. I can continue and continue. So, of course, the benefits for Belt and Road countries to get investment from companies with a lot of capital and a lot of knowledge and which are world leaders in their, sp in their spaces uh, have a fantastic potential for the next 10 years. What about partnerships, though, in parts of Africa? I'm thinking of, of places like Ghana, who are developing their, their oil and gas potential. Yes, I was involved with former President Kafur of Ghana in his establishment of the oil and gas sector in Ghana to make it less corrupt, make it greener, make it more efficient. But it has developed quite slow in Ghana, so it's not a massive industry as yet. But of course, no one should deny Ghana the right to have the income from oil and gas. My nation, Norway, or Saudi Arabia, Qatar, have, uh, Emirates have massive income from, uh, from, uh, from oil, and of course, Ghana should have that. But at the same time, the oil and gas sector should be as, less, uh, as little pollutant as possible. And Ghana, at the same time, have huge opportunities for solar, for wind. It's a beautiful country uh, with a very aspiring people. So we, uh, Ghana should be able to develop its oil and gas industry, uh, but at the same time, massively move into the renewable future. We need to talk about costs. I mean, the IMF says that global debt has risen persistently, uh, like two hundred and thirty-five trillion dollars is the number. It's staggering. With many countries then struggling to balance the books, what's that going to mean for the BRI? No, I mean, this is obviously a serious issue because no nation can really grow if at the same time it has a massive debt. So debt cancellation or debt issues must be discussed. But the good news, of course, is that all the renewables are now the, the most profitable industries in the world. If you drop uh, oil and gas or, or, or coal and you move into solar or wind, 
You produce the cheapest energy anywhere in the world. You base it on domestic resources, so you don't waste uh, um, resources on buying from, from somewhere else. And you create more jobs locally. So going into the green economy will not create a lot of debt it, to the country. It will create an enormous profitable industry, which is green and job creating. But of course, at this, we always need to look into a specific project to make sure that that is viable in the long term. Otherwise, you're creating problem for any nation. I mean, some critics have said that um, the Baltimore Road Initiative is a bit of a debt trap for, for some countries. What's your take? That's pure and simple anti-Chinese propaganda. <laughs> it is very, very simple. There is no truth in it. Uh, it's true that some nations have had some uh, debt issues with China. The same nations have normally had much bigger debt issues with, uh, with, uh, with the West. Let's take uh, Sri Lanka as an example. Uh, Sri Lankan debt was mainly with the West, but some of it was with China and some of it uh, was with India. But all have been, now been able to look into a restructuring of, of, of the debt. And by the way, China last week uh, uh, announced that it would be very helpful in uh, help, helping President Dan Vikram Singh go uh, over Sri Lanka to reorganize the debt. So while the West has created most of the debt problem, maybe better for the West to put up a mirror and look into how the West can solve its problem than to finger point to China, which has a much smaller problem in this area. Now, we've talked a lot about infrastructure, about modernization, but I want to pick up on something you mentioned earlier about bringing people out of poverty. Um, because the World Bank says that by 2030, BRI-related investments could lift 7.6 million people out of extreme poverty, 32 million out of moderate poverty. So tell us a little bit more um, about how the Belt and Road Initiative, as a cooperation platform, ha has created opportunities within communities, for, for women, for example? Absolutely. And, of course, uh, I think Belt and Road can also do even more in the future with a better dialogue with local communities. If you want to establish a road or a railroad, you need to, uh, to speak to the people uh, which will benefit from, but also will be affected from this to look into their interest. The same comes with, uh, with, uh, with uh, re renewable energies. But overall... Uh, women tend to benefit more from this than men. If we create solar energy, which can give street lighting at night, women tend to be even more happy than men because we, they feel more safe to go, go out at night. Uh, women tend to be more uh, customers of, of uh, metros or, or, or public transport than men because few women have, uh, have cars. So say when China just recently brought the first metro to or helped Vietnam create the first metro in Hanoi, it's a women-oriented project, but of course benefiting, benefiting, uh, benefiting everyone. And by the way, China now has more metros than the next 10 countries in the world combined. It even has 50% more than the next 10 countries in the world. So China is by far the biggest constructor of metros and any kind of public transport. And the more China can share that experience, that capital, that know-how uh, with other developing countries, the better life women in these nations will have. So let's talk about sharing that capital, sharing that know-how. Looking ahead, where else, wh which countries do you think could benefit from closer cooperation with China? An obvious nation which will benefit, but which where, where, where this is very controversial, is the relationship between China and India. These are the two biggest developing countries in the world. Both have a population of 1.4 billion people. But unfortunately, at the moment, the political relationship between the two countries is very tense. But if some of these issues creating uh, political uh, differences between China and India can be overcome, there is an enormous opportunity because these are two huge markets, uh, neighboring nations, uh, mutual investment, Chinese technology being used in India, but of course also Indian technology being used in China. Uh, these two nations combined is 37% of the global population, and they are probably the two fastest growing economies in the world. India may even now grow faster than, than, than China. So the opportunities here are enormous, but there are some political obstacles to really uh, get, get all the benefits of the potential. Talking of obstacles um, and of political difficulties, um, as you put it, what about the impact of the conflict 
and uncertainty we're seeing in Israel, the ongoing war in Ukraine, the, the hangover still um, from, from COVID-19. How will all of that affect overseas development programs like um, the BRI? I mean, will the next 10 years be slower and face more challenges than the last 10 years? I'm optimistic and believe that we can see more in the next 10 years. When look, uh, Africa, Latin America, the developing countries in Asia, they're all concerned with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for sure. Uh, they're all concerned with Ukraine for sure. But mainly they're focused on their own development. There's 1.2 billion people in Africa. There will soon be 2.5 billion people in Africa. All of them want development. All of them want to be part of the global middle class. All of them want education, all of them want good connections. And Belt and Road and China has the opportunity to help with all of this. And of course, the West should also look into how we can, how we can help more. So this desire for development uh, will be there uh, from everywhere. And as soon as, we, uh, as long as we avoid kind of global wars, uh, I think we will see a strong, strong development uh, desire from Africa, Latin America and Asia happening, even if we see horrible pictures on TV from Ukraine or, or the Middle East. What do you think the OR is going to look like in 10 years' time? I think in 10 years' time, this will be, by without any comparison, the main number one driver of green development in the world. China is not so far ahead of the rest. I mean, frankly, Europe and North America need to get, get up very early in the morning if they want to comp uh, compete with China. Uh, in the green sectors. I mean, China is basically between 60 and 80 percent on everything green. Solar, wind, hydropower, electric cars, electric batteries, elect um, high-speed rail, whatever, whatever you are interested in, China is between 60 and 80 percent. And bringing that technology, knowledge, investment to the world is fantastic. Uh, the response from the West should not be so much competition, uh, but to how to complement more. Uh, the United States has not developed any high-speed rail in the United States itself, uh, in the United States itself ever. China has in, <laughs> built 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail just in the last 15 years. So it's highly unlikely that the United States can compete with China when it comes to high-speed rail. But the United States, for instance, have a very, very vibrant medical industry, which all developing countries will want to benefit from. The United States has also some of the most high-class educational institutions like Harvard or Stanford or whatever, and the developing nations want to send their students there. And of course, they also want to send them to Jiaotong and Shanghai or Tsinghua in, in Beijing. So let the West look into can be complementary rather than competitive to China. And then Belt and Road will be the major uh, global driver of green growth in the next decade. Eric Selheim, thank you very much. Thank you. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find more Agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.